the church, ecumenism, and the salvation of the world. Excerpt from A Call from the Holy Mountain by Elder Ephraim of Philotheo and Arizona. As the church is the body of Christ, and Christ is omnipresent, so is his church spread to the ends of the earth. All those Christians who have been baptized in the name of the holy, consubstantial, life-giving, and indivisible Trinity, who acknowledge our Lord Jesus Christ as the God-man, the Redeemer and the Savior of the world, and are sanctified by the divine word and the holy sacraments of the Orthodox Christian faith, all these constitute the body of the one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church of Christ. Christ's Church is Catholic in the sense that it possesses the entire fullness of the truth and the grace to illuminate and redeem the world. It is, moreover, Catholic in the sense that it tends not to conquer, but to sanctify the world. The head of the Church is Christ, and we are members of it connected by the common faith in conjunction with love. The history of the Church is the story of its struggle to sanctify its faithful. This is the church established by our Lord Jesus. This is the church of the holy apostles. This is the church of the holy martyrs. This is the church of the holy fathers through the ages. The church of yesterday, the church of today, the church of tomorrow, the church unto the end of time that shall enter in triumph into the infinite blessed life of the ages to come. For the church is the home place of the Holy Trinity the very image of it, and yet more because it is the body of the incarnate second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ. It is in consequence the eternal possession and property of the Holy Trinity, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We firmly believe in one God, Father, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Our faith has this quality of eternity. The history of the church throughout the ages testifies that a few Christians may err for a long time, or many Christians may do so for a short time, but it is impossible for all Christians to err forever. Because the church as a whole, as the body of Christ, is guided by the Holy Spirit and ever since it was founded has been led by it to the whole truth. The history of the Church also testifies that ever since its foundation, the Antichrist has been trying to infiltrate into its divine body to disintegrate it and annihilate it as he had attempted against Christ's body. But just as the dead body of the Lord saw no corruption and arose from the dead, so too Christ's spiritual body, the Church, even if it goes through the shadow of death, shall fear no evil. Christ, the Church's, life-giving power granted to the devil for a season, that he may put the faithful to the test. The Word of God says that he which deceiveth the whole world will try through the Antichrist to deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect of the Church, but not the Church itself. The human members of the church will be deceived, but not the church. Those members in whose faith and life by the devil's treachery there shall prevail the human element at the expense of the divine and the gifts of this age at the expense of those eternal blessings of the age to come, believed in and anticipated, shall be deceived and cut off. The devil's craftiness in leading astray the elect, in particular, lies in forging devoutness and in urging excessive zeal so that the believer may reach decisions and perform actions which will remove him from the blessed fold of the church. At this point, we should underline that falsehood may result in error when it looks all the more like truth. From this dire ordeal suffered by each one of the faithful at the hour of temptation, the highest temptation in their lives, and through which the church shall pass when the Antichrist shall attempt to forge Christ's spirit, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Mere knowledge of things divine cannot save us. It is the taste, indeed, the experience of a life in Christ that will do so. 
And this is so because Christian truth is not an intellectual affair, but a living experience of the dogmatic and moral doctrines of the faith, and a mysterious and mystic communication between the faithful and its founder. Do not wonder at what is said about temptation. For just as Christ was tempted, so shall his church enter into temptation. However, just as Christ vanquished the tempter, so shall the church vanquish the Antichrist, that wicked, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The work of iniquity is already underway. If one fears so much so, as to try to spread his roots deeper into the waterways of orthodoxy, and to strive for a greater and more sincere participation in the sacraments of our most holy church, by frequently communicating with Christ, he shall have the mind of Christ, and shall come unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, in a way that he may not only evade the risk of erring, but may also become for others a fixed guide to the kingdom of heaven. The more we sanctify ourselves, the more the body of the church is sanctified even in its human form. For in its divine form, it is as holy as the Lord Jesus Christ. The history of the church is the story of a struggle to sanctify its faithful. He who believes not after the tradition of the church is an infidel. But although many are sure of their firmness in the faith, They declare, at sundry times and in diverse manners, their fear lest the heads of the church should forge the orthodox faith, and after betraying its prerogatives they drag it, bound hand and foot, to one of the well-known heresies, to papism, for instance, or Protestantism, or to the sum total of heresies, ecumenism. We already know that although the church is represented by a number of its members assigned to important posts, It does not spread its universal conscience by means of the actions or decisions of these representatives when these actions or decisions are not in absolute agreement with what has been the common heritage of the Orthodox Christian faith through the ages. It is only then that the final decisions, even of the ecumenical councils, bear the mark of validity. That is, on the one hand, when the holy delegates are able, with fear in God, and that their hearts might be comforted to utter that sentence of the Holy Apostolic Council. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And, on the other hand, when the flock of the Church, the Orthodox clergy and laity, acknowledge what has been decreed as if they themselves decreed it, as if it had been uttered by their own mouths. In cases of deliberate or undeliberate deviation from tradition, judgment has always been, is and shall be pronounced by the sound public opinion of the Church, which by right intervenes and restores peace in the Church. Peace, not truth, for the grace and the truth never abandon the divine body of the Church. It abandons those who in wavering concerning faith have made shipwreck and betray the birthright of the common heritage of those taxed in the heavens. It never abandons the flock of the church, either clergy or laity. That is why, remain with the church, counsels St. John Chrysostom, and ye shall not be betrayed by the church. If you do depart from the church, the cause is not the church. If you are inside, the wolf cannot enter. If you go out, you will be the prey of beasts. The fault does not lie with a fold, but with your faint-heartedness. Nothing may equal the church. Dear brethren, just as we cannot be saved by others without our consent, neither can we be betrayed by others if we ourselves do not betray the cause of our salvation. You may have probably heard that in the summer of 1973, an exarchy of the Holy Ecumenical See came to the Holy Mountain. When the most reverend Metropolitan Maximus of Stavropoulos who was heading the exarchy, posed a question concerning the commemoration of His Holiness the Ecumenical Patriarch. We answered that we would commemorate the name of His Holiness as long as He would follow the path of orthodoxy. If He strayed, we would discontinue doing so. His Eminence then said, 
But how can the patriarch possibly stray from the path of orthodoxy? And we answered, If his holiness cannot possibly stray, then we may not possibly cease his commemoration. That is what we said at the time. At present, we are praying all the more fervently, for clouds are again gathering on the horizon of the Fanari, and we do not know what the weather will be like tomorrow. In our times, more than ever before, a great deal is being said about union. The Church has always prayed for the union of all. But today the password making the round from mouth to mouth among all the Union supporters, warming up the hearts of all its adherents, does not originate from the self-consciousness of the Church. It comes from abroad. It is the work of him whose task is to sow weeds in the garden of the Church, to deceive the uninitiated in the mystery of Christianity or in the sacraments of the Church. Satan did his best to snatch away countless men from the bosom of the church and to present it before the world as being divided and weak. Now he is again doing his best to unite it into a peculiar union of his own inspiration, using as leaven the formula of love. Such has been the plethoric use and abuse of this love by so many that others neither wish to hear nor talk about love. Thus, a cold breath has started blowing both where love is being much talked about and where they have stopped talking about it. The Lord has said, And many false prophets shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Those who talk profusely about love tamper with its contents that they may embrace heretics of all textures, This love is as false as false flowers are. The Church has no place among the conglomeration of errors and heresies, ecumenism. The rule is that where much is being said about a virtue, that virtue is not to be found there. The voice raised in favor of that virtue is the cry of its absence. This is the case with the love of all those who believe that they should contribute towards the realization of the Lord's wish, that they all may be one. Let us be more specific. They say that we Orthodox should unite with the Roman Catholics, and then with the Protestants and with all the known and unknown heresies conceived by the devil in the name of Christianity. After all Christians without exception unite, they should then unite with the Mohammedans, the Jews, and in extension with the Buddhists, Brahmins, Shintoists, and with all the religions of the universe in general. This pan-heretical alchemy is being inspired through the so-called World Council of Churches. We think that the term is not true to the fact, for it does not concern a World Council of Churches, but a World Council of Will Worship. The only God to demand a tribute of worship there will be the fallen Beelzebub, who through his representative among men, the Antichrist, will try to substitute his own will for the faith and worship of the true God. For in ecumenism there is no personal God. For consistent ecumenists the doctrine of the Trinitarian God is utterly rejectable. It is well known that the devil instigated Zionism, is coordinating two insidious operations both within and without the church, aspiring to one and the same end, to destroy the fortress known as orthodoxy. Papists, Protestants, Jehovah Witnesses, Freemasons, Unionists, Ecumenists, and all other root of bitterness, all these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. We believe that orthodoxy has no place among this conglomeration of errors and heresies. This insidious ecumenical fabrication does not wish to seek out the truth, but, according to Father Aralambos Vasilopoulos, is a mixture aimed at exterminating the truth. It is an effort not for those that have been deceived to find the truth, but for those that do have it 
and lose it. That is, those who believe in the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. Let us not deceive ourselves. Between orthodoxy and heterodoxy, there exists an enormous gap. When even the champion of the World Council of Churches, Metropolitan Meliton of Chalcedon, is forced to admit it is an undoubted fact that the World Council of Churches is 99% under the control of Protestantism and strongly carries its mark. What more evidence do we Orthodox need to sever relations with them before we crush any hope left in them that the truth really exists, unique, intact, and lucid to be found in the one holy Orthodox Church of Christ? The strong position taken up by Father George Florovsky that Orthodoxy's mission is to be a martyr and bear witness unto the truth may be fulfilled only with an orthodox ecumenism described by Father Spiridon Bilialis in his book Orthodoxy and Papism. We believe that it is high time that the Orthodox Church come forth united before the world and promoted its own orthodox ecumenism by setting up purely orthodox ecumenical rostrums, where from its loud voices it would proclaim Urbi et Orbi, that orthodoxy alone is today the one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church of Christ. Otherwise, with this frequentation of such church representatives, with today's heterodox and tomorrow's atheists, orthodoxy will run the risk of suffering what St. Gregory the Theologian said happened in similar cases. It is easier for one to be infected by iniquity than for him to transmit a virtue just as it is easier for you to contract a sickness than to have health bestowed on you. Let us not deceive ourselves. Between orthodoxy and heterodoxy, there stands an enormous gap, says Professor Andreas Theodoru. But can't Christian love bridge this gap? Many ask. Love, my dear brethren, is omnipotent, as mighty as death, but its strength always goes hand in hand with truth. God transmits the power of his love when he is worshipped in spirit and in truth. The disciple of love, the apostle of orthodoxy, setting down the words of his epistle, says, The elder unto the elect lady, i.e. the church, and her children whom I love in the truth, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ the Son of the Father, in truth and love. All those who truly believe, love in truth. Those who do not truly believe, love in hypocrisy. We, being Orthodox Christians, love everyone and desire that they come to realize the truth. Thus were we taught by the God of love. Thus is our conscience set at rest. We feel no animosity against any men because of their heresy or their faithlessness. But we shall never come to love faithlessness or heresy for the sake of men, because if we do, we shall be alienated from God. One Sunday, a preacher delivered a sermon on love your enemies. On the Sunday after, he spoke against alcohol addiction, about the havoc it wrought among the Christian peoples. Incidentally, the infamous Zionists greatly boast about this in their notorious protocols. When the preacher, then, referred to drinking and described its effects as mortal foes, one of the smart listeners who, by the way, are never missing, stopped him short and said, Father, didn't you say last Sunday to love your enemies? The preacher calmly answered, I told you to love them. I didn't say you should swallow them. Something similar is happening with us Orthodox in relation to all non-Orthodox. We love them in all sincerity and pray for them, remembering the admonition of St. Ignatius the God-bearer. Also pray without ceasing for other men, for there is hope for repentance in them, that they may come to realize God. We love them so that they may renounce heresy, error, faithlessness, and wickedness but we cannot assimilate them as they are, piecemeal with their heresy, their error, and their atheism. 
Salvation shall come from the Orthodox. We judge no one, because there is a judge who shall judge all of us. But we believe we should tell everyone, whether far or near, that by the grace of God we have acquired a life experience, namely, that salvation shall come from the Orthodox. Only the Orthodox East agreed to venerate and worship God in spirit and in truth. Western man stood up against Eastern mysticism ever since the beginning. He took the Christian faith slightly on the surface. He did not let its renovating force pierce to the depth of the old man, to have him reborn and to transform him. In essence, particularly after the tragedy of the schism, Western man did not wish to bend his proud neck humbly to the yoke of Christ, but in a perverted sort of way induced the Lord's church to serve worldly values and objects. It was inconceivable, but fatal. For some time now the West has been hinting at saints without God, and that God is dead. Even if these blasphemous utterances were void of any context, they are intolerable for the sensitive ears of the Orthodox East. Here, where God and man meet in the path of life, man bows down in humility and pleads for the mercy of the compassionate Father. And that he may become worthy of this mercy at any cost, he binds himself to repentance for life. Through remembrance of death and by means of exercise, he daily puts to death the old sinful man in order that the new man of grace may receive the privileges of life. The pathway of the Christian Orthodox, both within and without the monasteries, is an ascetic one. If, sometimes, the Christian East appears to be forgetful of this significant element of its spirituality, Orthodox monasticism always finds ways of reminding it of this fact, gently and affectionately. Christianity is the soul of the world. In the incomparable text of the Epistle to Diognetus, the Christians are compared to the world in this way. As the soul is united with the body, so are Christians with the world. Christianity is the soul, the life and the hope of the world. Had Christ not come, or if his church were for a very short time to disappear from the face of the earth, then we would see whether the world that lieth in wickedness would be able to endure its unbearable stench. Christianity is in consequence the soul of the world. Monasticism is in proportion the Christianity of Christianity. And hesychasm by extension is the monasticism of monasticism. The message of hesychast monasticism to contemporary man, who flees from the present and from himself, and who divides his mind and heart between the reminiscence of the past and the expectations of the future, and the message of love of humble asceticism to the brethren in Christ is exercise, psychosomatic exercise, mental exercise, concentration of the mind on the heart in investigation of the conscience, fasting in accordance with the holy canons of our church, vigilance about incoming and outgoing thoughts, prayer without ceasing in the name of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ, each one according to his capacity and every one willingly, for there is no other way to salvation. The grace of God helps, and thus the things which are impossible for men are possible with God. The disease of the Spirit is sin. In the past, man suffered in body, Nowadays, he is suffering in spirit. Medicine has ousted disease from the organic region, but is compressing it more and more into the invisible and unmade inner parts. There, it works without being seen and appears by another way. Man is now possessed by his guilt complexes to a disconcerting degree even for the specialists. The suppression of guilt is a second sin, and the general neurotic behavior is sin says Professor J. Kornarakis. All specialists agree that neurosis is the number one enemy of the mental health of a people and is certainly a vital problem of our age. The disease of the spirit is sin, agree all the Holy Fathers. 
By sin and through sin the evil spirits do their damaging work upon the children of disobedience. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage, says St. Peter the Apostle. Only the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Savior Jesus Christ, may deliver man from the destructive effects of sin. Only in the light of the dialogue of confession do all the machinations of the deceit of wickedness vanish, and the soul finds rest. And only with the body and the blood of Christ may man become the bearer of Christ and God and achieve the purpose for which he was created. I said, Ye are all gods and the children of the highest. St. Basil the Great says this explicitly. Man is a creature that was given the order to become God. It is in his power to do this, and he should start now. For God is perfect and infinite. And will feeble man manage to overcome in time his defects with the assistance of divine grace so that he may march forward to infinite perfection? When is he going to dismantle the work of sin with which he had been busy all these years that he may gather in a little fruit of repentance lest his wretched soul starve to eternity? Time passes, but it refers to eternity which does not. That is why the Holy Fathers urge, if you have time, do not wait for the opportunity. The old are approaching death, but death comes to the young. And I shall judge you whereupon I find you, says the Lord God. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. It suffers violence temporarily today, now. It also suffers violence morally, repentance. Exercise this everywhere and in every way, in any weather and at any time, as much as man can and as much as God wills. God always wants much more than what man can desire. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. There have always been laymen with hearts of monks, and there have always been monks with hearts of laymen. It is not the place, but the means that makes the man. Repentance, my brethren and fathers in Christ, as St. John of Sinai says, is a renewal of baptism. It is the greatest source of redemption following baptism. Let us remember the steadfast knock of repentance on the gates of the kingdom, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Velder Ephraim of Philotheo in Arizona, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.